Hey guys, I'm back. I'm here. How are you? I'm going to go ahead and start answering your questions uh, in just a second. Um, welcome to the first live chat uh, that I'm doing from my home office here in, in Michigan. Hello. Um, my name is Brian Barron. For those of you who don't know me or maybe you've heard of me and haven't seen the face, uh, I'm the director of skincare research here at Paul's Choice Skincare, and I work remotely. Uh, you've probably, if you've watched my live chats before, um, you've probably seen me looking much better because we have a studio at our Seattle office where we have professional lighting. Um, and yeah, it's just much more suited for this type of thing. But we didn't want, it's not a vanity project for me. Uh, so we didn't want to keep all of you waiting until that once every two, three month time when I'm in Seattle and can sit down on the beauty couch and do one of the live chats. So here I am uh, from my humble home in Michigan. Um, ask, ask me what's on your mind about skincare. I know we've got some questions here already. Uh, I will do what I can to get to as many as possible. Let's start with uh, Nicole. Nicole wanted to know what I think about cleansing conditioners, which I'm assuming are the type that you would use for your hair. And um, yeah, cleansing conditioners, um, a little bit of anecdotal information, but not necessarily from personal experience, is that everyone that I've spoken to has tried a cleansing conditioner, which essentially replaces your shampoo and conditioner. Although if your hair is really dry and damaged, you're gonna need a heavy duty conditioner as well. But everyone I've talked to who has tried cleansing conditioners um, hasn't kept at it. So they, uh, one of the popular brands is Wen, uh, which is sold primarily on QVC, but L'Oreal and other lines jumped into that uh, arena with their products as well. Of course, they didn't stop selling regular shampoos, but that's another story. Cleansing conditioners, what happens is they tend to not clean the hair well enough. Um, the conditioners, the conditioning ingredients in there, which are usually fatty alcohols, have some ability to clean the hair, some, but they aren't really adept at cleaning the scalp. Uh, so if you have, uh, if your scalp is overproducing oil, if you have a condition like dandruff or dry flaky scalp, uh, the cleansing conditioner can help with the, dry, the dryness and the flakiness, but if it's dandruff, you're going to need to use a medicated product for that. There's just limitations with, with cleansing conditioners. Um, I, I get the appeal, and uh, for certain, a cleansing conditioner is going to be less drying on your hair than, than most shampoos, but there are also a lot of really nice moisturizing shampoos out there that you can consider. So my advice is there's no, there's no reason not to try a cleansing conditioner, assuming that it doesn't have problematic fragrant oils, and then you're massaging those into your scalp, and a week or so later you're wondering why your scalp is so itchy, that's probably why. Uh, as long as they're carefully formulated, give them a try, see what you think. Uh, it's also totally fine, I've got my Luke Skywalker glass in anticipation of the new Star Wars movie. Uh, it's also perfectly fine to alternate between a cleansing conditioner and a regular shampoo and conditioner. Let me close out the topic by saying uh, if you use a lot of styling products, like I do, um, cleansing conditioners will not work well for you. You will just feel like your hair has buildup on it. It's never going to feel clean enough. Uh, if you have normal to fine hair like me, you're probably going to find that because the cleansing conditioners don't remove the styling product buildup that your hair starts getting limp uh, and may actually become harder to style because there's just so much buildup. You're not getting that lift and volume that you want. So take a little sip of my iced tea. All right, moving on. This is kind of fun. Let's see. Uh, Nicole had another question. Dare I answer two of her questions? Sure, why not? Uh, she says, do you believe that the benefits of a broad spectrum sunscreen outweigh the benefits of potentially irritating ingredients in any circumstances? Um... That's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure if she's implying that some sunscreen ingredients are irritating for some people. 
Uh, and therefore, it's better to accept the risk of irritation from those as opposed to going without protection, which I would say, yes, it is better to go that route. However, not all sunscreen ingredients are going to bother your skin, whether they're synthetic or mineral. If you have been through several sunscreens that contain uh, ingredients like alabenzone, octanoxate, octosalate, homosalate, and you're finding that you're always getting a little bit of irritation or stinging, even if it's just around the eye area, then I would put you uh, into the group of people that really should stick with mineral-based sun sunscreens, which would have either titanium dioxide or zinc oxide as the active ingredients, or a mix of both, uh, which some do. And then you'll find some that have zinc oxide or titanium plus some of the so-called synthetic actives. So those might be worth trying as well, because the ratio, the percentage of sunscreens uh, is, is different in those types of products. You've got usually, if you're looking at SPF 30, you've got maybe four to 6% uh, of the mineral active, and then the remaining synthetic actives uh, comprise, depending on the formula, anywhere from five to 10% of the actives. And it could be that that lower load of active ingredients, separate from the mineral, uh, is the secret sauce that's going to work for you. But really, with any sunscreen, the name of the game is experimenting until you find one that you really like and that works for your skin type, works with the other products you're using, works under the makeup you like to wear. Maybe your makeup even has extra sunscreen in it. Nothing wrong with layering sunscreens. We encourage it. That's why we did our uh, smoothing primer with sunscreen. Ugh, sock was falling down. Uh, anyway, okay, let's see. What, I think there was another part to your question... Under any circumstances, um, what else can I say there? For certain, even if, if you have a choice between using a sunscreen that has some problematic ingredients in it separate from the actives, like maybe it's denatured alcohol, maybe it is lavender oil, maybe it's a citrus oil, I would still say, especially if you're going to be outside for a long period of time, it is better to endure that than to go out into the sun without any sun protection on. This is, just bear in mind, what I'm suggesting here is kind of the, one of those in a pinch type situations. There are plenty of broad spectrum sunscreens, SPF 30 and above, that don't contain any problematic ingredients. So those are what you ideally should be using, but if it's a choice between going outside with nothing and a problematic sunscreen, I would, I, I would always say just put the problematic sunscreen on, uh, hat, sunglasses, make yourself look nice and, uh, you know, fashionable. And let's see. Okay. Uh, Maria, perhaps Mariah, I'm going with Maria, uh, says, when will the 4% BHA exfoliant be available in Germany? And she is referring to our new pore refining treatment that just launched. So we have our foaming treatment and then we have a new version of that really kind of kind of from a, a ground the ground up new and improved um and i was a big fan of the foam we're keeping the foam around for a while for the foam vans um but the new serum type four percent bha uh is my is my new favorite exfoliant uh, i i don't use it every day because my skin can't doesn't need really I probably could handle that much exfoliation in terms of the soothing ingredients we use, but I generally use the 1% BHA from our Calm line. <clears throat> and then once or twice a week, I'll, I'll, I'll alternate in this new 4% core refining treatment. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Maria, we will not be able to sell this in Germany because of European Union restrictions on the amount of salicylic acid that can be sold in over-the-counter products. I believe Throughout the EU member countries, of which Germany, of course, is one, the amount of salicylic acid is capped at 2%. <coughs> that doesn't mean that you can't order it and have it sent to you. Um, but, of course, that is a more costly route to go. Uh, Emil says, since L-ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, is so unstable, would using one of the vitamin C derivatives instead provide more consistent antioxidant protection throughout the day? Uh, that question, the answer to that question comes down to the formula. There are, even though L-ascorbic acid or ascorbic acid, those terms are used interchangeably, uh, even though it does have an inherent instability, 
if it is well formulated, carefully formulated at the proper pH and the right kind of packaging that either eliminates or severely minimizes light and air exposure, uh, there's no reason to not use ascorbic acid during the day. However, derivatives of vitamin C, magnesium ascorbyl phosphate, tetrahexyl diesel ascorbate, uh, ascorbyl glucoside, sodium ascorbyl phosphate, there's a few others, those uh, have varying degrees of greater stability than ascorbic acid. But really, for most of those, uh, what it means is more important to a cosmetic chemist than it is to your skin. What I mean by that is that all forms of vitamin C provide antioxidant protection, provide anti-aging benefits, help to protect the skin from environmental assault, even help to mitigate visible signs of accumulated sun damage. It can't erase sun damage. It won't erase wrinkles. Let's not get nuts here. Uh, but vitamin C can do a lot for skin in all of its forms. Where was I going with that? Like all of a sudden I just lost my train of thought. Oh, from a cosmetic chemist perspective, what I was saying about the various forms of vitamin C is that the derivatives, including all of those I just mentioned, are generally easier to formulate with and they're easier to incorporate into different vehicles. Moisturizers, serums, toners, uh, whereas ascorbic acid is a bit more finicky in terms of I already mentioned the pH. It needs, it's got a kind of a tight pH range. It needs to remain effective. Uh, and it's also a, a bit finicky as far as the base that it is in, and some are better than others. Uh, so generally speaking, the other forms of vitamin C outside of ascorbic acid uh, are just easier for a chemist to work with, but all forms of vitamin C are going to benefit your skin. Do -do -do. What do you think? Rupee wants to know what I think of growth factors, human and synthetic. Would Paul's Choice ever make a growth factor product? Uh, the second question is easier to answer, and, and it's no. Um, I think growth factors are very, very fascinating in terms of how they work naturally inside the body. I don't think there is much to go on in terms of growth factors in skincare. Uh, because without getting too complex, the growth factors that are used in skincare are said to offer often amazing sounding anti-aging benefits. The tricky thing is, uh, is, is keeping those ingredients active, keeping those ingredients stable. Uh, I've seen certain brands offer growth factor products in jar packaging. It's not going to keep them too stable for that long. Once you take the lid off and start dipping your finger in, if it's an airless jar, okay, uh, but that's not typically what I've seen for such products. The big concern with growth factors is that we don't know enough about what could potentially happen when they're applied to skin. There is research uh, on wounded skin that shows that applying growth factors or injecting growth factors can help those wounds get better faster, uh, but Skin concerns uh, related to aging are not the same as what happens and how skin heals after it's wounded. So it's a bit of an odd connection to make. <clears throat> the concern is in our bodies, growth factors work in a very carefully orchestrated manner. This has to happen before that happens. And then this kind is very much like a symphony. Not every instrument is always playing at once. There's a, there's a, there's a calibration that has to happen in order for the entire sequence to be effective. <clears throat> I'm not getting the connection between putting growth factors on your skin, which generally speaking is a pretty good barrier, and hoping that they'll somehow connect it to growth factors uh, that are in the lower layers of skin and have some sort of action. So I don't really buy it. Uh, it's not something that Paula's Choice is going to pursue, but it's, it's nevertheless an interesting field of study, uh, it just doesn't relate to skincare as strongly as some brands make out. The, the proof of efficacy just really isn't there, and there's also some risks involved. Okay, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, TLJ. Hi, Brian. I'm using a mineral-based cleanser, but I find it drying. Is it possible some oil cleansers can be drying? Oh, mineral oil-based, sorry. It's like, well, if you just pure minerals, yeah, that can be drying. 
Uh, okay, mineral oil based cleanser. Find if it is possible some of the some mineral oil cleanser can be drying. You know, mineral oil, there may be something else in the cleanser that you're using that is making it feel drying to you or actually just causing it to have that, that effect. And it would have that effect on most people. Uh, so it's not like, oh, it's just me. It, it's probably the product. Uh, mineral oil is one of the most emollient ingredients out there. Uh, it is one of the best ingredients, despite its bad reputation, which is completely undeserved. Um, it is one of the best ingredients for holding water in the skin and for keeping air off the skin, which sounds like, oh, yeah, I've heard mineral oil suffocates skin. It doesn't really work that way. What we mean by keeping air off the skin is that it actually keeps oxygen from damaging the skin uh, in the form of little free radicals. So I suspect there's something else going on in that cleanser that's causing a problem. Um, oh, Marlo said to Marie, I don't think they're going to release the BHA 4% in Europe. Marlo is on top of things. Thank you, Marlo. Uh, Elizabeth says, I'm still having lots of closed comedones. I'm using the 4% BHA religiously. What other PC products can I combine this with to help? Um, Elizabeth, I would say add BHA9 to your routine if you have not done so already. The other thing, uh, the other combination I like is to cocktail our BHA exfoliants. You could do that with the BHA9 and then follow it with the 4%. Or you could do that with the Skin Perfecting 2% BHA liquid. Put that on with fingers uh, or, or a cotton ball. Um, and then spread it around. Put the 4% pore refining treatment on top of that. Some closed comedones are just going to be stubborn. I hate that. Uh, and they will take some time to resolve. So for some people, it is going to be a little bit more of a slow and steady wins the race type thing. You might also need to consult a dermatologist uh, for some of the more stubborn comedones and have that have the dermatologist um, manually deal with them uh, without getting too gross. But the good news is when you have that done, generally if you keep up with your at-home exfoliation, the closed comedones do not get as bad as they once were. So you can use those at-home exfoliants for maintenance. I'm not saying you won't ever get any more bumps, but chances are good they will not um, be as stubborn and they'll be easier to deal with via over-the-counter products. Okay. Ms. Beverly, what is the difference between Resist Brightening Essence, Pure Radiance Brightening Treatment, and the Radiance Renewal Mask? Do I need all three of them? Uh, you don't need all three. However, it's fine to use all three, uh, and research suggests that the more such brightening ingredients that you can layer in your routine, the better, and that for dealing with stubborn, uneven skin tone, uh, that combination of the same, uh, or let me rephrase that, the combination of different brightening ingredients and different products can have a synergistic effect, as opposed to just saying, okay, I've got an uneven skin tone uh, that's making me look older, and I'm going to go for vitamin C, and that's all I'm going to use. There's nothing wrong with doing vitamin C and niacinamide, along with some acetyl glucosamine, along with some arbutin. All of those ingredients can help, and it's not like, well, does that mean that vitamin C just doesn't do enough on its own? Not, no, that's not the case. The reason that all of those ingredients help is because they all go to work on that concern via different pathways. Um, and when they are all working in synergy, you're going to have a greater response uh, than anyone alone. I wish I could think of a good example off the top of my head, but I hope you understand what I mean. Uh, in terms of the common threads, the brightening essence, pure radiance, the radiance renewal mask, they all contain niacinamide. That's, and they all they all contain vitamin C, but different forms of it. I believe the brightening essence has a scroble glucoside. The brightening treatment. I can actually just pull that up. You know the the brightening treatment has some other interesting ingredients. 
I'm wearing it right now. Like mulberry and acetylglucosamine, which is a nice little partner with niacinamide. Okay, there's, yep, you see the glucosamine, there's niacinamide. You'd think I would know these ingredients off the top of my head. There's the vitamin C. So the writing treatment has tetrahexyl diesel ascorbate, along with white mulberry, Chinese mulberry, licorice root, used in an amount that can help impact on an uneven skin tone. So, yeah, I would say if, if you can work all three of them into your routine, I would suggest doing so. I actually, yeah, I have all three on my bathroom counter right now. I don't apply them all at once. Um, I, let's see, what I would typically do for myself, because uneven skin tone is a concern of mine, I, I use Pure Radiance Brightening Treatment in the morning under my sunscreen, and then I will use the brightening essence at night. I'll cleanse, I'll tone, I'll put on my BHA exfoliant, I'll follow with the brightening essence, and then I'll usually finish with either a serum or a moisturizer, and I might throw in a booster as well. Um, all of these products I'm mentioning have thin textures, so it might sound like, you know, gosh, she's putting on a lot, but it doesn't feel like a lot because they're all, they just go on so nicely. So I don't, in that case, I don't mind layering at all. And then the Radiant Renewal Mask, I'll use that a couple of nights a week. And I use it, It, you know, it's funny, it does have efficacious levels of those ingredients to fight uneven skin tone and to really brighten the skin. But I love the texture of that mask and I'll kind of like, I put it on like frosting uh, when my face is feeling a little drier or looking a little dehydrated. And I, you know, as far as the concept of a sleeping mask goes, that's what I love Radiant Renewal Mask for. So I kind of like use it to seal everything in a couple nights a week when I feel like my skin needs something extra. So try it and see, try that methodology uh, and, and see what you think. It is absolutely fine to use all three at the same time one after the other, you want to layer from lightest to heaviest texture. So that would be the brightening essence, then the brightening treatment, and then the radiant renewal mask. If you have combination to oily skin, you'll want to separate the application that's going to be too much hydration for you. You'll look shiny. Uh, which, again, I know I when I do that at night, I will look shiny and I don't care because I love how my skin looks the next morning. All right. <clears throat> Gore says, I'm not an expert, but the best thing I've tried for closed comedones is BHA in the morning and a retinoid in the PM. Absolutely worth trying. Uh, Mandy asks, what's the best regimen for rosacea? Uh, Mandy, I wish there was a single best regimen. I could say this is what anybody with rosacea needs to use. Um, rosacea cannot be dealt with successfully via skincare. You almost always need to talk to your doctor about topical treatments. But where skincare has a role is in helping to visibly diminish the symptoms of rosacea, of which the number one is redness. So in terms of choosing a skincare routine when you are also dealing with rosacea, the key word is gentle. The second key word, very close second, is going to be fragrance-free. Make sure Everything you are using is fragrance-free, and by that I also mean no fragrant natural ingredients. Some sensitive skincare lines or some, some lines marketed people who are dealing with redness will throw in lavender or rose or eucalyptus and say that they're soothing, and technically they're not lying because all of those plants I just mentioned do have some soothing, calming properties. However, at least in their volatile oil form, which some brands use because they smell great and they make the products smell great. And can consumers love products that smell great, right? I mean, what's the first thing you do when you open a skincare product? You give it a whiff. Before you, you know, most, a lot of people do that before they even touch it. They're like, I don't care what it feels like. What does it smell like? It's important. So one of the things Paula's Choice struggles with as a fragrance-free line is how to make our products not smell bad 
uh, and still put in those effective ingredients at levels of research has shown are necessary, but not add any fragrant ingredients to cover up the natural scent some of these ingredients happen to have uh, and still give you an effective general product. Uh, but I digress. Redness, fragrance-free, gentle products. I wouldn't necessarily be too concerned. Sometimes you'll see advice for rosacea that says, well, use products that have the fewest possible ingredients or only use one or two products in your routine. Just cleanse and moisturize. It's really short-sighted advice uh, because simply because you have redness and are dealing with rosacea doesn't mean that the need for sun protection goes away. Doesn't mean that the need for exfoliation goes away. And it doesn't mean, especially if you are dealing with that issue in your 30s, 40s, 50s, which happens for a lot of people, especially those of Caucasian nature and European descent. Hello. Um, thankfully, I don't, have, I don't have that yet. But, um, you know, I, I wouldn't shock me if it, I mean, Irish, hello. Um, that... All of, those, the, all of those concerns and what I was getting at earlier was signs of aging. Those can all crop up and you, can't, most, you can ignore them, but most people won't want to. So choose gentle, fragrance-free products for your sunscreen. Make sure it's mineral-based. Within the Paula's Choice line, I would start with our Calm collection that was specifically formulated for extra-sensitive and redness-prone skin. And then you can kind of branch out from there based on how your skin responds. But again, if what you're dealing with is really rosacea, you will need to consult a dermatologist, partner with him and her, him or her to make sure you're getting the proper medical uh, products to get that under control. Don't, um, don't skip seeing a dermatologist to deal with that because skincare won't cut it. Uh, all by itself, and rosacea will get worse without treatment. It may take some time, but it will happen, and I wish it wasn't the case, but... Okay, so how do you know when you're done all you can with potions, lotions? This is from An Anon Mom 2012 How do you know when you've done all you can with potions, lotions, and serums, and you should just enjoy the results rather than trying to strive for an unrealistic expectation? Oh, I love this question. This is absolutely something that I have asked myself. There, there, isn't, there isn't a slam dunk answer for everyone. I will tell you that from my perspective as an almost 44-year-old man uh, who has been in the skincare industry uh, for over two decades, that I'm constantly fascinated and very often impressed by what great skincare can do. Um, and one of the best examples I can give you is the fact that I've been wearing sunscreen pretty much every day uh, for the past 20, 25 years, maybe longer. No, that, yeah, it's about 20, yeah, probably 25. Um, and my, my skin at my age, uh, even without a stitch of makeup or anything else on, looks noticeably younger, more even, less lined. Um, I'm not experiencing any signs of, uh, of sagging yet. Um, I'm sure that will come in time, but I would rather it happen as late as possible in the game as opposed to dealing with something like that now. And I attribute a lot of that to my daily use of sunscreen uh, and to my regular use of an AHA or BHA exfoliant I've switched on and off over the years, but this is just, this is almost like a philosophical question. Um, I want you to be careful that you're not overdoing it. Uh, there is a temptation with, especially with anti-aging products, those that contain retinol and vitamin C and peptides and hyaluronic acid, to think that if a little is good, then more must be a lot better. So you're using so many products that contain bioactive ingredients or you're, you're peeling and you're using a scrub. By peeling, I mean like you're going in to see an esthetician or a dermatologist for a high-strength facial peel with glycolic acid, for example. But then every morning you're using a scrub and you're using a leave-on BHA exfoliant and you're using a hydroquinone product and a prescription retinoid product and a high-strength vitamin C product and on and on and on and on and on all at once your skin is going to start showing kickback 
from irritation. It's, 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 I've said this before in videos and various chats. It isn't that those ingredients are inherently a problem for skin. In the right concentrations and, and used according to directions, they can be brilliant for skin, but we tend to go, we get excited and we tend to go a little overboard and pile everything on uh, in, in an attempt to look as young as possible for as long as possible. What I have found works really well is alternating between those more active products. As an example, I use our Resist 1% Retinol Booster two or three nights a week. The other nights, in terms of a retinol for myself, an over-the-counter retinol, I'll use our uh, Resist Intensive Wrinkle Repair Retinol Serum. I may put on our Barrier Repair Moisturizer that contains retinol. Uh, and then the following night, for my anti-aging treatment or boost, I'll put on the C15 Super Booster, and maybe I'll layer that with the Hyaluronic Acid Booster and then one of our antioxidant serums. I have this product wardrobe, if you will, uh, from Paula's Choice, 99%, uh, of what I know has worked well for me, what I know uh, my skin uh, can tolerate, and I get great results. So rather than trying to approach anti-aging as an everything but the kitchen sink approach, um, try that method of just alternating products in much the same way that you alternate what you wear clothing-wise on any given day and see if that helps. And then in terms of the results that you're getting, in terms of when to know when you should stop. Sorry, I don't mean I, I, that. Let me rephrase that. Not when you should stop, when the results are as good as they're going to get, which I think is, is what you're asking. Um, you have to realize that that skincare has limitations and the ideal bridge for dealing with signs of aging, particularly as we get into our later decades, is that the best approach for most of us is going to be a great skincare routine that includes exfoliation, that includes daily broad spectrum sun protection, daily, every day, no exceptions. If you wouldn't skip brushing your teeth every night, don't skip putting on sunscreen every morning. The more you know. Um, <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I'm just like thinking, retracing where I was going with that. I got distracted. An email popped up. Um, expectations, anti-aging, skincare, results. It's all coming back to me now. Oh, duh, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Brilliant anti-aging skincare routine along with the cosmetic corrective procedures, I feel like my life just caught up with me, that are suitable for what your concerns are. Uh, and you can discuss those with a cosmetic dermatologist. It isn't one or the other, it's that combination of both because those procedures are gonna pick up where the skincare has limitations. So. If you're seeing a more even skin tone, a brighter skin tone, uh, a visible increase in your skin's firmness and smoothness and supple feeling, you're not getting clogged pores. Your pores that used to be larger are visibly diminished in their, in their size. You're never gonna completely get rid of your pores. You're never gonna completely make your pores invisible. You wouldn't wanna do that. They're a part of your skin's biologic makeup. If you're liking what you see in the mirror as a result of your skincare, and you don't have, you may have other concerns related to your skin that are bothering you. And and if you're if you know you're using great skincare and using it according to directions, and those concerns, uh, for example, like first signs of jowling or the eleven lines that come right here. Uh, aren't going away or they're not diminishing to the extent that you want them to, that's when you need to realize you've likely hit your peak with what skincare can do and you need to consult a cosmetic dermatologist and go to that other level while still maintaining your skincare. It's not, again, it's not one or the other. Okay. 
Great question, though. Danny says, hi, Brian. I'm so happy to see you all back. I'm happy to be back. And I promise I'll be more clear-headed as we go on. Logan, yay. <clears throat> Isn't it fun watching me scroll through questions? Uh, Moire13 says, is there any validity in the research that says lower levels of retinol used frequently have the same or better results than stronger retinols used less frequently? That can be an individual response. Um, I, I am of the mind that mixing up percentages of retinol uh, produces the best results. And the reason I say that goes back to what I mentioned several minutes ago about balance and not ever tipping the scales in favor of irritation. If you are using high strength retinol products all the time, for some people that can backfire. Some people can tolerate it just beautifully, don't get any sort of kickback whatsoever. I need to be careful and use the stronger retinol products less often, maybe once or twice a week, usually twice. Uh, and then lower strength retinols, I can pretty much use, you know, to my heart's content. I wanted to make sure I was addressing what you were actually asking completely. I, the research that I've seen about the high and low strength retinols, um, much of it has been looking at a prescription retinoid like Retin-A, tretinoin, uh, compared to over-the-counter retinol products. And the take-home message <clears throat> is that whether you are using a prescription retinol product like Retin-A, like Renova, Tazerac, um, or an over-the-counter skincare product that contains retinol, it's really about slow and steady wins the race. And however that works for you, uh, the you will need to use an over-the-counter level of retinol for a longer period of time before you will see, before your skin will come close to the results possible from a prescription retinoid product. The trade-off is that for many people, the prescription retinoid products can cause marked irritation, redness, flaking, uh, delicate, extra-sensitive skin. There's a rough patch. Uh, I think of the statistic is about a third of people go through when they're using that type of a retinoid, uh, and it causes a lot of people to stop using it altogether uh, but those who, quote-unquote, power through often find that their skin uh, gets over that hump and they kind of get into their groove with how much they can use and how often. And then they, again, balance. They're getting that nice balance of using the prescription retinoid along with the rest of their skin care. So I hope that was a satisfactory answer. If not, you can yell at me in the comment section. Well, be nice, though. My first question is about KP. This is from Megan Lewis. My two young daughters both have it. What would you recommend I use? Uh, based, uh, you didn't say how old your young daughters are, but let's say they're under the age of 10. Uh, I would make sure that you run any of my recommendations by your pediatrician just to get his or her okay. Uh, generally speaking, KP or those raised red bumps responds most favorably to a Levon BHA exfoliant. Uh, we have several, our weightless body treatment with 2% BHA is where I would suggest starting, uh, particularly for uh, people, it's great for people who don't want the feel of anything on their skin, but they want something that's really going to help visibly minimize the redness and, and the appearance of those bumps. That would be my number one choice. Uh, as a corollary to that, make sure that what they are washing their skin with is not a bar soap or a bar cleanser, even if it's Dove bar cleanser, which is not soap, it is a beauty bar. It's what's called a soap-free or a Syndet cleanser, synthetic detergent as opposed to a soap. Uh, the reason for that is that because a bar soap, uh, bar soaps have their own issues, but bar, both bar soaps and bar cleansers soap free or something else can leave a residue on skin. The ingredients that keep them in bar form can create a film on the skin. You know, if, if you have uh, 
those shower doors and you're using a bar soap, you get buildup on that shower door that they, you then need to go in with a cleaner, usually a special bathroom type extra, you know, kaboom cleaner and get all of that off, right? And you're kind of scrubbing and scrubbing. Same thing's happening on your skin over time as you're using that. So make sure that they're using a gentle water soluble body cleanser as well. There are several of them. Uh, if you live in an area, we're getting into the winter season in the United States. If you get in, if you live in an area that experiences a cold, dry winter, uh, look for a product like Olay um, Ultra Moisture Body Wash. I like that one. And then Dove Sensitive Skin Body Wash uh, is a personal favorite because it does not have any fragrance. Uh, I have personally found my skin from the neck down just looks a lot better and is much happier when I do not use a fragrance body wash. And that was a struggle for me because I actually really like those smelly body washes. I mean, I know it's not good for my skin, uh, but luckily my skin actually showed me that they're not, they're not my friend. So as much as my nose liked them, my skin did not. Okay. Uh, Peronita says, hi, Brian. What? Oh, I hope I didn't butcher that name. Uh, what's your view on hydrofacials? I think they're fine. Uh, I, they're not. They're, they're oversold. You got to take the claims for them, especially the ones that sound too good to be true or the grain of salt. But they're, they're fine to have done. Knock yourself out. Uh, any facial like that, it's a, it's a personal experience in terms of if you're, if you're getting it from someone that has experience, knows what they're doing, I would recommend getting one from an, a licensed esthetician, not your hairdresser that happens to have set up a hydrofacial station in the back of her salon. No, no disrespect meant to the local hairdresser. Uh, but this type of a facial is really best handled by an esthetician, uh, someone who is specifically trained in, in, uh, in skin as opposed to hair. But our, we all go into those procedures with certain expectations, and it's important to keep your expectations realistic. A hydrofacial or any other kind of facial, it's not going to make a 60-year-old look 40 again. It is not going to lift sagging skin it is not going to have a pronounced firming effect. Pretty much any result from a facial of any sort is going to be short-lived. And we know this to be true because you go back and get more facials, right? Facials aren't a one-and-done type thing, just like skincare is not a one-and-done type thing. you got to keep using the products to maintain the results. Alicia says, can you blot physical sunscreens to get rid of the oiliness or do you remove too much of the sunscreen? I don't want to look like I've dunked my head in water all the time, but you know, you need sunscreen. You do need sunscreen. Um, I wear a mineral sunscreen, uh, one from SkinCeuticals that I've mentioned a few times before. Uh, it's their SPF 50 one, and I have combination skin, so my T-zone gets shiny. I used to blot, but then I got concerned that, just like you're asking, I was taking off too much of the sunscreen, so what I started doing was using our Shine Stopper product, which rather than blotting in terms of like pressing a piece of paper and then like, ugh, you know, throwing it away, the Shine Stopper is something that you, it's a, it's a creamy type product that's very light and you dab it over the shiny areas and then you don't rinse it off. You just let it do its work and it has a very cool absorbent factor. It uses what's called micro sponge technology. And it literally are, are these tiny sponge-like ingredients that sop up. It's kind of like how charcoal works, but without the mess and without the coloration issue that charcoal presents. Nothing wrong with putting charcoal on your face in terms of a charcoal mask that you're then going to rinse off. But Shine Stopper is something that you can dab on and go about your day uh, or use in the middle of your day and not have to reapply everything. But both charcoal and that micro sponge technology and Shine Stopper absorb and adsorb. And the adsorb part is important because it holds that oil in place and keeps it from redepositing on your skin. So you, we have clinical tests that show that the participants got at least six hours of shine control, meaning their skin did not look oily again for a period of six hours. My mileage varies, and it depends on what else I have on my skin, but I can generally count on about two to four hours of 
worry-free shine control. So I would do that because you're not going to, as long as you're dabbing and not rubbing, don't rub it on there, uh, you're not going to disrupt your sunscreen. Uh, Maria H., I want to introduce my brother who doesn't know anything to skincare. Which book that sums it all up do you recommend? Well, our book, of course, The Best Skin of Your Life Starts Here. That might be a little bit too much too fast for him. Um, I'm looking over at my, my collection of books. They're all a bit textbooky in terms of like if I were to give this to one of my guy friends in the same situation, their jaw would drop and say, <laughs> uh, no, I'll just ask you. Uh, so off the top of my head, I don't have a book recommendation for you. Uh, what you could n nudge him toward are some of our articles on our website. The expert advice section, there's a category called basic skincare tips. Maybe you could go there and pick out a few articles. We have a men's skincare section as well that you could direct him to, but the, I like the information and the basic skincare tips as more of a good primer. Maybe you could send him a few links to those online articles and kind of gauge his response from there. Maybe he's not ready for a full-on book yet. you got to be slow with us guys and skincare. Okay. Stephanie says, I've been using the entire... Calm for dry skin, saved my skin, but now I feel in need of more exfoliation. Skin flaking off even when hydrated. Any recommendation? Your, so skin flaking off even when hydrated tells me that you're either using something in your routine, and it might be one of our products, that is too drying for you, or that you might need... You're using Calm for dry skin. You might need something more emollient, um, especially if you are living in the U.S. in a part uh, of the country that gets uh, drier in the in the winter months uh, as, as the mercury drops. Let's see. One of my favorite... Oh, there's my dog in the background. Uh, one... Oh, I have three dogs. One of my favorite products to adapt a routine when you've got flaking skin uh, is our moisture renewal oil booster. So rather, if you're, if you're really loving the moisturizer in Calm for normal to dry skin, the redness relief moisturizer, keep using it. But as you apply it at night or even during the day, and then you'll follow with your sunscreen, um, the moisture renewal oil booster comes in a dropper. And so you just put a little bit of the moisturizer in the palm of your hand, drop, 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 of the oil booster. You can mix them together and then apply as usual uh, and go about that. Actually, that would be the last step in your nightly routine unless you're using an eye cream uh, or eye gel based on texture preference. And then you just put that on and, and hit the hit the hay. Um, the other in terms of exfoliation, though, I don't if you're seeing flaking skin, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to need to graduate to a stronger exfoliant. Uh, flaking skin isn't exfoliating skin because the way AHA and BHAs work is that they help our skin surface to shed those dead skin uh, that it would normally that would normally happen imperceptibly. Uh, little kids, their skin is exfoliating. My three-year-old, almost three-year-old son, his skin is exfoliating all the time but it's still perfectly smooth and you're not seeing little flakes of, of skin on, 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 uh, on, his, on the surface of his skin because it's happening imperceptibly. Uh, it can and often does become faulty as we get older and accumulate more sun damage, which is why AHAs and BHAs are so brilliant because they can jumpstart that process again. Um, if you want to experiment with a different exfoliant because the Calm has the 1% BHA uh, concentration, I would suggest trying the 2%. We have a 2% BHA lotion in the Skin Perfecting line that you could try, or if you want to try a liquid that is going to penetrate skin's uppermost layers a little faster, uh, our Skin Perfecting 2% BHA liquid is great because that also is super hydrating. So that might solve your issue right there. And 
you might find that you don't want to go back to the calm 1% because the 2% liquid or lotion is really the ideal product for you. And it's okay that it isn't in calm. All of our BHA exfoliants have those nice soothing ingredients added. There's a little bit more of them in calm, uh, but I think with the balance of everything else that you're using, you're, it's not, you're not depriving yourself. Okay, I've got about 10 minutes left. So it's time for the sip of water and power round. Let's see. Uh, Isabird says, Hi, Brian. Would you recommend using the HA booster if the weather is super dry? I figure if there's no water in the air, it will draw the little water that's on my skin. I hate winter. <laughs> I don't hate winter, but I don't like the extreme cold. So I'm, I'm probably a good candidate to, to live in the mitten state, as they call it. Um, I would recommend using the HA booster if the weather is super dry, but I would recommend sealing it by following with a regular moisturizer. That's exactly what I do, and I find it works brilliantly. Um, so definitely give it a try, and it's so nice around the eyes, too. Uh, Tara says, should have used a green straw for your Luke beverage. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Here's my green straw. Just throw that one out. Ta-da! Brilliant suggestion. That is the color of his lightsaber. Okay, Danny says, my eyelids and under eye area get very dry during the winter. Is it okay to apply moisturizer all over the eyelids? <clears throat> love the skin recovery moisturizer, love from Norway. Uh, yes, generally speaking it is, particularly if you are talking about uh, products like ours that are fragrance free. The big deal with getting stuff in, your, uh, in the eye itself is fragrance or those fragrant ingredients that can be sensitizing. If you find some products have a little bit too much slip though, so what you might find by putting a water-based moisturizer like Skin Recovery on your eyelids is that it actually uh, can migrate a bit into the tear duct area and you might get a little bit of that, um, is temporary, blurry vision. Um, kind of like when you get something in your eye and you're just sort of blinking and, and then everything all is right again. So I don't want that to happen. What I would suggest, uh, if you find that that is what's happening, make sure when you apply to your eyelid area that you kind of stop about right here and note that it's when, when the product warms to your body temperature, it's going to get where it needs to go, but it's not gonna go too far. The other trick is to, is to dab and then move away from the tear duct like this, as opposed to doing this, where you're kind of pushing the product towards the tear duct, which is the entry point to get into the eye. Again, we don't want that. Last, uh, you could try using a balm-like product that has more tenacity, like the Paula's Choice Lip and Body Treatment Balm. Uh, that is amazing for dry patches. I got my sister started on that, and uh, she hasn't complained about them since, so I, I guess it's working, and she would let me know. Uh, Aquaphor ointment or even plain Vaseline can work in a pinch as well, although both of those are going to feel more greasy and you just want to be careful with how much you use. Do, 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 do. Maria, hey Brian, so good to see you. Which Paula product do you recommend after a professional TCA peel? Uh, I would recommend something very soothing after any professional peel, regardless of what the ingredient is uh, that was used. TCA is trichloracetic acid. Uh, it's rather potent. I would say our Calm Redness Relief Serum would probably be my top pick. Uh, if you really want to get fancy about it, you can apply the Resist Advanced Replenishing Toner first, follow with the serum, and then put a nice emollient moisturizer like our Clinical Ultra Rich Moisturizer on top to really soothe and soften and help the skin recover from that process. Lots of Maria's. Oh, Erin says, where are the dogs? Erin <laughs> is a co-worker of mine. She is on the product development team. One of our higher-ups. We love Erin. Uh, another Maria says, I recently started working on a lab, and there's a laminar flow cabinet that needs to be disinfected with UV light whenever you're not using it. So should I be replying sunscreen more often? Wait a minute. What is she asking? I thought it needs to be disinfected with UV light. 
Oh, so she, okay. So you're exposed to that UV light via the disinfecting properties in a lab setting. Uh, you do want to be, yes, you do want to be more careful about how often uh, you are reapplying your sunscreen throughout the day. Uh, for Assuming that your hands are coming into contact with that UV light because of setting it up and monitoring things. Um, I'm not quite sure how big this is or what the net of exposure is. But yes, any uncovered skin, hands in particular, because you'll be washing them throughout the day. You could also wear uh, protective gloves, uh, either that you bring in yourself or that the lab provides. That would solve the issue. Um, and then you wouldn't have to worry about applying sunscreen as much. So maybe try that. Uh, but yes, sunscreen would be necessary in the absence of such protective gloves if your hands in particular are constantly being exposed to that UV light being used for sanitation. Uh, if it's your face, um, sunscreen touch-up sprays, like the ones that Kula makes, that's one brand. Oh, search on Sephora. There's a few others on Sephora that are out or on Beautypedia. Uh, you can find some there. And, and uh, those have alcohol in them typically uh, so that they dry really fast and don't ruin your makeup. But if you are applying them on over makeup, not to worry about the alcohol getting through and causing any issues. Okay, what's your opinion on lactic acid? This is what Angie wants to know. Uh, I like it. It isn't as well researched as glycolic acid, but it is probably the number two AHA. It does not, <clears throat> uh, it is a larger size compared to um, glycolic acid, which is the smallest AHA. So some people think <clears throat> or would reason that it's a bit gentler on skin. There is a size difference for sure, but I think the difference in terms of effectiveness is negligible, but there is more research pertaining to AHA uh, in relation to visibly improving signs of aging. There you go. Okay. Alexander, dear Brian, I have a combo skin with a lot of black and white. I have clog pores in my mouth, and especially in the chin area. The built of dirt in these areas, especially how to get rid of, it's high concentration BHA would be the best solution. Uh, yes. Along, yes, a high concentration BHA product would absolutely be uh, what I would suggest for that. I would also suggest uh, for the stubborn blackheads uh, talking to an esthetician. Uh, you might need to have those extracted. That is not something that I would suggest doing at home, particularly if you have a lot of them. Uh, it can just, it's just not fun. Um, also make sure that other products that you are using in your routine are not too heavy for your skin type and aren't contributing to clogged pores. Uh, if that means that you need to layer thinner textured products to get to that right balance of not clogging, uh, then that is absolutely worth experimenting with. I know it's extra products, but wouldn't you rather layer two thin textured products to get the hydration you need, knowing that they won't cause clogged pores and bumps? versus using that one cream that, yes, gets you through your routine faster, but you're constantly dealing with clogged pores. I know which one I would do. Uh, let's see. Paul, hi, Brian. What are your thoughts on the weaker UVA sunscreen in North America? Weaker UVA sunscreens in North America as opposed to stronger ones in Japan and Europe. Oh, well, it's a regulatory question, Paul, and both of those countries have different standards and there's also more active ingredients for sunscreens that are approved for use in the USA. I am confident that the actives that we do have here, the way that sunscreen chemists are using them in products, uh, and there's that's a whole other discussion, but the way that they're being used in products and the amount they're being used is giving adequate to amazing protection. I'm using a U.S sold mineral sunscreen. I love it. I'm not seeing any deleterious effects from it. Um, I mean, yes, Europe and Japan have more options, and I'm hopeful that down the road, uh, the U.S. Uh, and Canada and Australia, for that matter, will have more active ingredient options to use in sunscreens. But I wouldn't, I honestly would not say uh, that the sunscreens you can get in the EU or, or in Japan are inherently better than those you can get in other parts of the world, for what that's worth. Uh, will PC release another mascara? There is not one in the works, but never say never. That was from Tara. Maria says, I love the cleansing oil. It's just amazing. Now I know why it took you guys some time to come up with it. 
<laughs> that was a project. You'd think cleansing oils would be relatively simple, but, uh, and you know what I love about that product? Because I was talking about fragrance and how it can mask the smell of, the natural smell of even some of the better ingredients. We created an amazing product without any fragrance and it's, I, I, I love that fact about it because so many cleansing oils are just, they're like liquid perfume. I don't know what some of these companies are thinking. Hey, okay. I really should wrap up, but there's, oh my gosh, there's so many questions. All right, you guys. I'm like looking at this live chat list here as sort of like a slot machine. So I'm just going to kind of toggle the lower third of it back and forth and we'll settle on one more question. And to those whose questions I didn't answer, okay. Uh, to those whose questions I did not answer, uh, I'm sorry. Um, please save them for the next time. We will schedule another one of these um, very soon, probably next week, actually. Oh, Rocco, Rocco Buzz. Last question. I'm considering getting a microdermabrasion in the next week, but I'd like to get a 40% AHA also at the same time. I have combo scan and it is not sensitive. What do you think? I think your skin is more sensitive than you think it is. Uh, if you think it can handle both of those on the same day. And here's why. You may have seen, uh, you may have read uh, this from us before, but I'm going to repeat it. Your skin can be good at hiding when it's being irritated. So having these stronger uh, treatments done back to back uh, especially if you're thinking, you know, oh, that went really well. I'm going to go back the next week or the next month and do it all over again. And meanwhile, your home care routine has, uh, has you using some stronger products, some more bioactive ingredients. That can all conspire to cause, uh, really, it's like a, almost like a hidden sensitization that you will not see until years later. So I would just urge caution, Rocco. I, I, I'm not a big fan of microdermabrasion. Um, I just think it can be too much. It, the, the way that that process works, um, my concern is that the aluminum oxide crystals just really kind of erode that skin barrier. And if you're just kind of shooting that all to H-E-W, you know what, it's, it takes a long time for that to build back up and it can really send your skin into a tailspin in the meantime. So 40 and 40% 40 AHA is a lot. Uh, but between the two of those procedures, I would go for the 40% AHA peel and skip the microdermabrasion. Uh, and at the very least, I really, really, really urge you to not do them on the same day or even within a few days of each other. Pick one. Maybe you're leaning towards microdermabrasion. Don't do it. Uh, and so, okay, start with that one and then look at doing the peel down the road. All right. That's it, you guys. I am going to sign off. I thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you for not commenting on, on uh, the lack of professional lighting. Maybe we'll change that in the future. Um, <laughs> I'm glad that my dogs didn't bark. And uh, we're looking, uh, to, I, think, I think we're going to schedule something for next week. Uh, probably same bat time, same bat channel. So Luke Skywalker and I bid you a fond farewell. And we'll see you soon.